Good morning. Hope everyone is doing good today. It does my heart very well to uh, see the Vanderfords back with us today. So. so church, today we're going to continue in our service, uh, in our series, excuse me, in the book of Psalms. Uh, and I must say it has been, uh, it has been a timely series speaking to what I believe are current needs in the church. Um, and just to let you know, uh, you've heard of uh, the, the weeping prophet, uh, Jeremiah. Today I'm going to be the, sort of the whispering uh, preacher today for you. <laughs> so I'll just keep that in mind as I'm trying to salvage his voice through a whole time period of preaching. So in the past few weeks in particular, we've had a common theme dating back to my last sermon on June 2nd where I spoke about the confident and trusting prayer of David and how it taught us to acknowledge who God is and what he's done. And then we heard from Pastor Jeff on how he is a present help for what you're dealing with right now uh, in your lives. And then Ben gave a powerful message last week on God as the father to the fatherless of whom we all were uh, spiritually until he saved us, adopted us into his family, and now cursed for, cursed for us as a loving father. And you will see uh, this common theme continue today in the message that the Lord laid on my heart. So today we're looking at, in Psalms 121, being kept by God, being kept by God. We get to see kind of a culmination of all these powerful messages uh, on who God is that hopefully informs some of us for the first time and reminds others that we are kept by God. Now, what does that mean exactly, church, uh, that we're kept by God? It means that our yesterday, today, and tomorrow are secured. And we will see today how he has been a part of your life and mine since before you or I even knew him. Or we even existed as Psalms 139 tells us about his work and even knitting us together in our mother's womb. And Romans, uh, verse, in, uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, we also see how the God has been playing a part of our spiritual lives as well and how he's been a part of that throughout time. So it is, the whole picture is, is a loving God, a powerful God, and how he is keeping us and has kept us throughout our lives. God has ordained the path of salvation, according to Romans 8, uh, 29 and 30, to where he has been a part of all of it through, uh, through, in the past tense is spoken of because he is looking at it in his time frame, not in our time frame. And why is it spoken in that way? Is because in Christ, it's already done, church. So church, you may ask, what does this all have to do with being kept by God? Well, first, let's look at the biblical definition of the word kept. The biblical, def biblical definition of kept is to be watched over, preserved, and guarded. When we are kept by God, we are reserved, set apart, spoken for, saved, and held. This term is used to describe the keeping power of God the Father and Christ, which was exercised over his people. And we will see today how this text speaks of an assurance we have from God that no matter what he allows to come into our lives, we have the confidence of the promises he made for today, tomorrow, and forever. So please turn to our text today in Psalms 121 as we will cover the whole chapter today, that whole psalm. So it may take a little while to get to that uh, because it's quite a big uh, text today. And if you say I'm just joking, church. It's only eight verses. So it shouldn't be that long of a sermon today, or should it be? We will see. We will see. As you can see, church, other than my voice, I'm feeling it today because I love this text, and I love preaching the word of God, and this text here is one that's near and dear to my heart. Now, as you're turning there, if anyone does need a Bible, uh, we have some available for you in the back. If you raise your hand, one of our ushers would love to uh, bring one to you. Thank you. So a little context for the message today. This psalm is one of 15 straight psalms entitled in the Songs of Ascent. And scholars believe they were actually written based on the different stages of their journey to the temple in Jerusalem, uh, starting with Psalms 120, at the beginning leg, if you will, of this journey, right up to Psalms 134, which was the arrival there at the temple. So 
we're joining them kind of on the second leg, if you will. Now, three times a year, uh, the Israelites would take this road trip, if you will, of some 2,700 feet in elevation uh, to Mount Zion, where the temple was located, for one of the three major feasts that they had attended. This pilgrimage took three to seven days uh, on the most direct route, a little shorter if you went through Samaria, but longer on any other route around Samaria. The terrain was harsh, church, and there were bandits on this uh, terrain, on this trip, and they had to deal with the elements of a hot sun by day and cold nights uh, on this journey. Now, it wasn't like road trips we take uh, with families today, uh, as we're singing the hits from a personal playlist as we go along the highway traveling on I-10 or I-8, which are normally led enthusiastically by uh, dad, with one of the kids normally, and see if you recognize this picture, wearing earphones trying to sink into obscurity, uh, another kid lost in their iPad or iPhone, and mom pretending she's asleep for the journey. Now, I don't know if this happens in your context, but uh, it has happened in mine. No, this was more like immigrants traveling through uh, the harsh deserts of southern Arizona, uh, trying to make their way through. Yet all the while, with these uh, people here, they were singing songs of praise to God, which we'll actually read one of those in today's text as we join them on their journey. So now you have a picture uh, of their travel conditions, but church, I want us also to visualize ourselves on a pilgrimage today, on toward our heavenly home in heaven, because that's what we're on. As Paul speaks of in Philippians 3, when he says, reaching forward to what lies ahead, his mind his, and his vision was on something ahead of him, not where he was at at that time. He says that he pressed on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul's vision was that this is not home. We're traveling through. We need to have that same vision. He was talking about us being in heaven where we will spend eternity with our Lord Jesus Christ and all the saints of God who have made that choice to accept him. And this text will reinforce that just as they were kept under the mighty hand of God on their journey, so are we. Now, this was not a leisurely way to travel at all, but instead it was an arduous one. Yet these psalms speaks of them singing these songs on this uphill journey called the Songs of Ascent to praise their God whom they were excited to go and worship again with an extraordinary attitude expressed uh, more so by David uh, when he says in Psalms 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And we should share in that expression, church, and in that desire as the people of God today. So please stand to honor God as I read our text in Psalms 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Let's pray. Precious and eternal Father, as we come before you again to speak your word and to hear your word and receive it, we just pray that, Holy Spirit, you speak through me today. You give me the ability to speak. You give me the words. And let me just speak your word to your people today and nothing more. And I pray that your word would not return into your void, but would serve the purpose for which you're sending it out today. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Church, this passage is a song sung by people who had the assurance in their heart that they were kept by God. And today, I don't want us to miss two main themes that were portrayed by this song. One was they're seeking out God, who they trusted in their lives. And secondly, God's response to their seeking him out with total assurance in him. We also see some truths, or we'll see some truths about the reality that no matter what leg of this journey we may personally be on, we are kept under God's assurance. The Hebrew word that is used throughout this text for kept 
you will see come out in verses 3, 4, 5, 7, and 8. And there are words that will be, that you will see in the text of protect, guard. Uh, and as you see those things, those, those are a Hebrew word, which is shamer. And that word is a verb meaning to guard, to keep, protect, and observe. Because this is what God does over the, did over them and what he does over us. Church, when I served in the Air Force, there was a job I did, and some of you would be familiar with it, it's called security forces. Our job was to basically, if there would have been a, a, a word, a Hebrew word or a word to cover it, it would have been this word here. Because in our word, what we did was uh, we guarded the resources and people on the base, we protected them, we weren't uh, observing at all times things going on around them. Why? So that they could live their life, so that they could do the things they were supposed to do, carry out their mission, all up under the keeping of security forces on that installation, homeland and abroad, whenever we went anywhere. And that was our job, that while they were asleep at night, we would be on guard watching them and watching over the base. And things took place that they never had an idea were taking place because we kept them uh, under protection during that time, and that was a job that we had. And that's what God does for us, and we'll see throughout this text here today. So in this context, this word uh, kept falls up under the umbrella of total assurance. So what do we mean by this word assurance we keep talking about? Well, let's look at the definition of the word as a good place to start. Webster's definition of the word assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence. Confidence or certainty in one's own abilities, certainty in something. Church, these people were making a declaration of confidence and certainty, not in themselves or the things of this world, but in God. Look again at verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. For where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord. They were making a point which is our first truth, and that is God's our help and assurance. Not the creation God made, not the man-made temple where they were worshiping or going to worship at, not any person or thing. God alone is the help meet, meaning that he is the all-sufficient source for all we need, and he's the one we seek for every need and challenge we face. But church, if we're honest, God is at the bottom of our list of resources we go to when we need help. Instead, we trust in everything else before we seek him out. And church, honestly, this shouldn't be. This is, and church, this is why some of the examples found up under this definition in Webster are also true of the things that we put our assurance in today. They were things identified in Webster like insurance policies, retirement portfolios, and our own abilities like our long-range plans, projected career progression, and educational achievements. And if we're honest, church, we as the people of God depend on these assurances as well, sometimes more than we do on God. Because it's something tangible that gives us a sense of security and peace of mind. But we have to come to a place like these early believers who determine in their hearts that although God uses these resources to care for us, he is the only assurance for all of life up until the day we finish this race. Now, when you watch these other sources of assurance or, the, or, or security on TV or hear them on the radio, they're selling themselves as the best option for you because of their track record. Or they will get you the most money on your settlement. Or one of my favorites, you're in good hands with all state. And I can't get that voice today, right? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. They're basically endorsing themselves in an attempt to convince you why you should trust in them. But I love how the psalmist seeks God in this verse. In verse 2, my help comes from the Lord. Why? Who made heaven and earth. Church, the psalmist is declaring why he trusts in God by declaring who God is by his works which was a way to promote Yahweh above false gods in their day. Why? Because the attributes and the work of God declares who he is. Psalms 19.1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. 
or Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident to them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood what has been made. And then also, they trust in, in God's ability to keep them on their journey. Church, as because of the things that God has done, they figure that if God can do this, and that endorsement there, then I can trust in God as well. And church, we too must grow into that type of mentality and that faith that understands that this great God is able to keep us on this journey of life, that he ordained for us. No matter how rough the terrain gets, no matter what circumstances come, and in coming to this realization, we then realize all the ways God helps us. Not just in some situations, church, but in all the areas of life and godliness to include our day-to-day -day spiritual lives. How? How does God do this? By keeping us on the straight path, even when we veer off into sin, as referred to in verses 3 and 4 of this text. He will not, or excuse me, verse 3, 4, and the first part of 5. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Church, on this terrain, there was always a threat of slipping here or falling there, which could have claimed their physical lives. But church, this is so true also of our Christian walk. Like the psalmist, we must know that it is God who keeps us on the straight and narrow path and helps us navigate this terrain that we're on. And we must declare by faith and believe the next truth, which with the same confidence they had, and that is God is our keeper. It is God who is our keeper. Church, he's the one that keeps watch of us 24-7, never negligent in his duty of care and 100% reliable, and faithful to catch us when, not if, we slip and fall. But when we sin daily, we have his word that in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's a promise he makes under his keeping power. And when the enemy tries to step in and make us think that you've blown it, and we try to isolate ourselves because we feel we can never be forgiven for that sin we just committed. Paul reminds us of God's promises in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And of God's keeping power, uh, one of the most, my most uh, loved verses in Jude 24, and that is now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Some translations say falling, and to make you stand in his presence, in the presence of his glory with great joy. It is him who's able to do that. Church, I don't know about you, but that's some powerful evidence of God's keeping power over our lives. Please hear this, church. God's desired plan from the beginning was not only to save us from our sins in this life, but to see the whole process through until the end. And we can trust him. Now, church, here's what we see in the song, A Shift, from the psalmist seeking God to God's response, if you will, when we seek him. And I love the declarations uh, made throughout the remaining part of this text, which one commentator actually says, Reigns of God's response to our diligently seeking out his promised truth above anything else. Because God's promise to us, even today, when we acknowledge him first, still stands. As Jesus even commanded us when he said in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things should be added to you. And again in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desire of your heart. We must seek him for everything we need. But let me explain something for a minute here. 
Church, we got to come to the place as the body of Christ, where, excuse me, where our expectations or our aspirations line up with God's will. Sometimes we uh, have expectations of things that we look at and say, wow, I think God wants me to have this, I have that, I have this in my life, but we can't find a promise in God's word. We need to come to a place where we understand that the desires of, God, of our hearts should fall in line with the will of God and not our expectations going past, above and beyond his will for us, and then try on the backside to claim his promises to bring it in line. It would save us a lot of frustration by doing this. Church, this text alludes to God's involvement in every detail of life. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Church, this would be understood uh, in their language in their day to be used here as alluding to God's concern and protection over the personal affairs of their lives and the day-to-day -day situations both they and we face on our journey, which gives us the assurance of not just his ability to keep us spiritually, but his desire to protect us from not only personal attacks, which we go through, but from all circumstances of life. And that is not our jobs, our bank accounts, the federal government, but God who keeps us safe and healthy through the resources he ordains, yes, but it's still God working through those resources. And that is why our next truth is that along with his promises to keep us in his will spiritually by directing our path, also God is our protector. God is our protector. You see, like these travelers, we face dangerous situations, or dangerous situations that are known and unknown to us. The dangers lurk behind every corner and down every path. And in this sinful, broken world, no matter how much we plan on, for them, they come at us from out of nowhere and mainly at the worst times of our lives. But just like them in their day, the dangers were not just from personal sources like thieves or bandits or personal attacks from those who wish them harm, but could be completely circumstantial like rock slides or a slip or a fall that led to injury or facing illness out there on their pilgrimage or exposure to the elements which we're acquainted with here in Southern Arizona. But for us to look like, for us that could look like financial crisis in our lives, a health condition that rocks our world, a natural disaster, a car accident, or even spiritual attacks by the enemy church because the enemy loves to disrupt our lives and cause division in our families and personal relationships with one another. Please hear that. Why? Because it takes our eyes off God and causes panic or anxiety or fear or confusion and steals our joy for the moment. Why does he do this? It's all to distract from the mission that we're on as a church and individually. But church just like them, we must be persuaded that God cares for us so much that we could never find another source to replace God's protection, not even our own selves and our own abilities. Psalms 127 reminds us when we try to head off in our own direction or isolate ourselves, trusting in our own abilities, skills, or plans to secure our own lives, instead of God, it reads, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. When we lose sleep over things of this world, or the things, things that this life convinces us should be our priorities, and fall into the trap of thinking that we can control it if we just fix our bank account, or we can move this or move to a safer area, or find a better physician from a more prestigious healthcare facility. But it all comes crashing down, taking our security and hope and joy with it. But God, in those moments, promises, even though you didn't trust me at first, John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be 
fearful. His promises still stand for his church. Church, I'm so glad I know he is more than able to protect us, heal us, and provide whatever we need to sustain us on this journey. And we just need to realize that he alone can give the assurance that is given in Romans 8, 28. And that is God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The big question is, do you believe this? So here's a question for us all. Do you identify with the people in this verse? If so, you're covered by the assurance that he's got it all under control and will do what he has promised he will do. And all we got to do is just believe and trust in him. Church, in 2022, I stood face to face with one of the biggest challenges of my entire life when I was diagnosed with cancer. I tried to think through every scenario I could on the what ifs, and the flesh and the enemy whispered in my ear. Daily doubts about the goodness of God, fear of leaving my family behind, unfinished things I thought was, I was supposed to do, but church, when I finally got to a place of casting my cares on God, who had brought me through so many things in my life, and believing him based on his word, peace came rushing in. Even as I laid on the radiation table, a piece that said that, God, you are my story. Up to this point here, you have been God in my life. I trust you in whatever you do from here on out. And let me tell you, church, the peace of assurance that God loved me and had my best interests at heart and that of my family was never more clear. And let me tell you that I've been through other situations too, individually as well as with my family where I can be a witness to the truth of his protecting and sustaining power. So, excuse me, so why am I telling you this? Because I know that I'm not the only one who has been going through or is going through or will go through challenging times. Please hear my heart on this in God's heart. You are kept by God. Even if it doesn't look like it, he didn't bring you this forward to abandon you. Church, Jesus meant it when he said in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even if your name's not Lo, put your own name in that. I know the past probably wrote me up on that one. <laughs> Church, Jesus' declaration was more significant than we know because he was willing then, uh, he was willing to tell them then and us now that I didn't save you just to turn around and abandon you when things get hard. Or if you mess up along the way, or once it seems like you've got this thing down in your life, no. But we're promised throughout scripture this is an everlasting relationship with Jesus that started the time of our salvation, uh, started the time our salvation began and not ended at that point. He didn't just abandon us and say, you saved, I'm going to leave you now. No. Church, that brings us to the next truth that I want us to hear of what the Lord will do for those who put their trust in him as their helper. He ensures we will persevere through this journey. And that should be a good word because God is our preserver. God is our preserver, church. Look at verses 7 and 8 again. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Church, we need to ask God to give us a larger view of our relationship with him and how we are so extremely blessed by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because the assurance is promised by the word of God, don't end at our physical death, but just transfer it from this life to eternity. Now, church, if we can't get excited about that, maybe it's because we need to learn more about this abundant life that Jesus promises in his word to us. So let's do this for the remainder of the message. Let's take a look at just a few of the blessed promises that comes with Jesus' life assurance policy. And I did say assurance and not insurance, because insurance is something which we know provides guarantees based on you, guarantee, you contributing to that. And Jesus said, you know, I did this all for you. 
I came and did everything for you. It was free to you, but it cost him his life. Let's start with our Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wow. Praise God. Church, we will never be held responsible for the sins we committed in our life, past, present, or future. Why? Because Jesus paid that price. Can you imagine being in front of a judge knowing you're guilty and that the penalty of your crime is death and then having the judge say, you're free. Someone else paid for your crimes, for your sin, and took your, your shame and your guilt on them. Secondly, this policy comes with a guarantee of eternal accommodations. At the best place in heaven or on earth, you can call it Jesus' Airbnb. John 14, 2 says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told, I would have, uh, told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And it gets better than that. Not only are we cared for, as Paul says in Philippians 4.19, in this world, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and uh, glory in Christ Jesus. But look what Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Church, these blessings include his grace, salvation through Jesus Christ, adoption to his family, wisdom of his will and purpose in Jesus, a joint inheritance with Jesus, all sealed and guaranteed and assured by the Holy Spirit and the opportunity to reign one day with Jesus when his kingdom is established here. Wow. But listen, church, none of this matters if we never reach the finish line. But God has even assured that. In Romans 8, 29, 30, we're told, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. We're told how God has been planning this thing for all creation for those who believe, who come to believe in Jesus Christ. Right down to our full conformity to the image of Christ. And that is, because, is important because we are covered by the one who is able to do it. As we read in God's word, don't just take my word for it, but look at how the scriptures assure us in verse like Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. He's been working on this church for eternity. And I love the CSB version of that verse where it says God prepared ahead of time. So God's been working on this. You've been on his mind. He has prepared this. You are kept. There's assurance there. Church, God wants us to know that during these challenging times you may be going through, when it seems like all is lost and there's no hope, that our final truth is that he, is, he still is, has always been, and will forever be in control. And I believe somebody needs to hear that today. He still is, has always been, and will forever be in control of our situations all our situations. Listen to what Paul says about this God who you and I are kept by in Philippians 1 6. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. He will perfect it. It's not based on our abilities, it's not based on anything in the world. He will perfect the work that he began in us. This needs to be our testimony too, church. God promises that his plan for you and I will work. And because he's the architect of not only the heavens and earth, but our lives, he's almighty. He's not restricted by any time or schedule. He's just. He's all-knowing. He's infinite in wisdom, perfect in love, and he's infallible. Now, how's that for an endorsement? 
and we're kept by his might. He is a qualified helper who will not only keep us along this journey from falling completely away and protect us from every enemy, but ensure that you and I don't miss our appointment with him in glory. And not that you and I will be there on our own, but we will be there with all the saints in Jesus Christ every day. But church, our presence there is not the only thing. We would not just show up in heaven, but we're going to be there without guilt and without shame because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We won't be there feeling like we don't belong in that place. I just made it in. Is there any other? No. Jude 25 told us about that. Or 24. But without the guilt and shame of feeling like I'm out of place. But instead, we will have the joy of knowing he loved us so much, he wouldn't have had heaven without us. Let that resonate with you right now if you're struggling through a challenge in your life. The fact that you have an eternal date with Jesus and God. And God says, I will ensure that you make it on time. That should make everything else pale in comparison to what's going on. And there's actually a hymn that I used to love to sing, excuse me, that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Do you have this assurance in your life today? If not, what are you waiting for? Please let this be the day you stop trusting in the systems of this world, the government, trusting in friends' and family's opinions or your own abilities and your own logic, and give Jesus a chance to come in and transform your life. Let us pray.